Hello, this is Jim Sapersky, and welcome to Mental Health Care Today. Today, we are, have a special guest and delighted to have Dr. Katherine Phillips joining us on our show. Dr. Phillips is Professor of Psychiatry, DeWitt Wallace Schol Senior Scholar, and Residency Research Director at Weill Cornell Medical College, and an attending psychiatrist at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Dr. Phillips is internationally recognized for expertise in body dysmorphic disorder and related disorders such as olfactory reference syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. Dr. Phillips has been conducting pioneering research studies on BDD for the past 30 years, and she has been providing expert evaluation treatment for people with these and other conditions. Dr. Phillips, welcome to Mental Health Care Today. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm delighted to be here. Well, let's jump right in. Dr. Phillips, the term body dysmorphic disorder or BDD mm -hmm. may be new to a lot of our audience in terms of terminology. Can you take a minute and explain what BDD is, how prevalent it is, and, and just so we have a background knowledge? Sure. So body dysmorphic disorder, BDD, is it's a common and often severe mental disorder, but it, it's very under-recognized. And, and what people with BDD worry about is that there's something very wrong with how they look. They think they look ugly or deformed or abnormal in some way, but they actually don't. So they have a distorted body image um, and they don't recognize that they're, typically don't recognize that they're their perception is not accurate. And then they, they, they obsess about these perceived physical deformities, typically for many hours a day. And these worries about how they look cause significant emotional distress or interfere uh, with their day-to-day -day functioning, typically both. Uh, they can worry about any part of the body, skin, hair, nose. For example, they might worry about terrible scarring or acne. And again, in reality, these perceived defects are non-existent or just very slight. Um, and, and they also uh, engage in repetitive behaviors in response to the appearance concerns. So they might be checking mirrors for hours a day or uh, engaging in excessive grooming, trying to get their hair to look exactly right, or asking others, do I look okay? Um, and usually they aren't reassured by the answer, which is, yes, you do, you look fine. Um, and uh, BDD is not vanity. That's been a common misconception about BDD over the years. It is a, a really serious uh, psychiatric disorder. And, and on average, uh, people with BDD are quite impaired in terms of their day-to-day -day function because of their appearance concerns. Um, their quality of life is typically quite poor. And I think what I worry most about uh, with BDD is that um, a lot of people with BDD think about suicide, suicide attempts are very high. Um, and uh, that that's probably, it's one of the most worrisome parts about uh, BDD. It is common. Um, there've been five nationwide epidemiologic studies that have been done showing that BDD currently affects about two to 3% of the population. So that's up to nearly 10 million people just in the United States alone. And it's more common than obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, anorexia nervosa, et cetera, but it is very under-recognized. Uh, and so clinicians often have to look for it uh, in order to know that this is what their patient is suffering from. I'm, I'm just curious, as you described, how did you first become involved in studying BDD? Um, how did you get engaged with that? It, 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 right, probably... yeah, well, it goes way back. You know, when I was a resident, in psychiatry um, back in the early 1990s, I saw a few patients who were really obsessed with how they looked and I, I, it didn't make sense to me because I really couldn't perceive the deformities in their appearance that they were perceiving. They looked fine to me, but they were very distressed by this. Um, and, and one example is I, I saw a patient when I was a third year resident and did an evaluation and you know, he was very depressed and he had difficulty leaving his house because he was so anxious and had to stop working because he was so depressed. And I, I thought he had depression. And, and when he left our initial meeting um, um, and, and actually had his hand on the doorknob about to leave, he turned to me and he said, should I tell you the real reason I'm here? 
And fortunately, I, my next hour was free. And I said, please, yes, please do. And he said, this is so hard to talk about. It's because of my hair. And it turned out that, you know, he was so upset by the way his hair looked. Again, it looked normal, but he thought it looked abnormal and ugly. And it had really caused all the problems he had with working and leaving the house. He didn't want anyone to see him. So I, I, at the time, our field really didn't know what this condition was. I started, I had never heard about it in all of my training. And I decided I had to figure it out. I went to the library because at the time we didn't have the internet, right? So I went to the library to try to figure it out. And it turned out that cases of BDD had been described around the world for more than a century, but virtually no research studies had been done. So I, 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 I had to figure it out. I thought these people are suffering so much. Some of them are quite suicidal. We had no treatments. Mm -hmm. So I embarked on a career of getting funding and doing research studies and seeing patients and starting at the beginning, what are the symptoms of body dysmorphic disorder? What is the associated morbidity like suicidality? We needed scales. We didn't have any. Clinicians needed them. Researchers needed them to screen for and diagnose and assess the severity of BDD. And then I moved on to treatment, developing and testing treatments and other aspects of this disorder as well. Well, you touched on it, and I just have a kind of a follow-up question to that. Are there kind of symptoms or symptomatology that are general that would tip someone off that perhaps they should talk to someone about this? Yes, I would say, you know, if, if you're worried that there's something wrong with how you look and you're thinking about it, and it's for at least an hour or so a day, that cut point isn't written in stone, but if you're preoccupied, obsessing, and certainly if you're worrying about this for several hours a day, and if it is making you upset, if it's causing emotional distress, like depression or anxiety, or certainly if it's making you feel life isn't worth living, or if it's making it harder to function in your day-to-day -day life, it's affecting your concentration, you're not doing your job or schoolwork as well, it's hard to go out and be around other people, maybe you're avoiding social interactions, um, those are all clues that you may have body dysmorphic disorder and, and should see a professional who's knowledgeable about it because we do have very good treatments for this disorder. That's great. Thank you. Um, that, that strikes me too. Are there certain medical professions where you come across this more than others? And, and what would those be? Yes. Well, certainly mental health clinicians, because um, many people with BDD are also depressed and anxious, um, but BDD is often missed in a mental health. Uh, setting. And so screening, routinely screening all patients for BDD is, is very important. And, and clinicians who, who provide cosmetic treatment often see these patients. So about three quarters of people with BDD seek cosmetic treatment and about two thirds actually receive it. Uh, most often dermatologic treatment, which makes sense because skin and hair concerns are the most common concerns among people with BDD, but also uh, maybe 20 to 40% of them see surgeons also. Um, conversely, BDD is common in these cosmetic treatment settings. So for example, in a general cosmetic surgery setting, about 13% of people have BDD. In a rhinoplasty setting, you know, people among people who are seeking uh, nose jobs, about 20% have BDD. So it's really pretty common in these settings and in dermatology settings at all as well. And the problem with this is that cosmetic treatments almost never help BDD and can make it worse. Um, and, and the reason is the BDD isn't a problem with actual appearance, you know, it's a problem with distorted body image. So changing how a person looks doesn't change their tendency to obsess and worry about minor or non-existent flaws in their appearance. That, that's very helpful. And you answered my question, would it solve, does it solve the problem when they go to surgery? And it obviously doesn't. No. And sometimes, you know, sometimes this is one of the other things that is, is very worrisome about BDD potentially is that these cosmetic procedures can actually make patients worse and they can become more suicidal. They think now they look even worse than before the procedure. And this can also be risky to the, the clinician who provides the cosmetic treatment. Um, a study, a, a survey of 265 surgeons who provide cosmetic surgery uh, mm -hmm. found that 40% of them reported that uh, someone with a patient with BDD who they had operated on 
threatened them. 40% had been threatened legally, physically, or both by a patient with BDD who was very upset about the outcome of the surgery, even though objectively, you know, the outcome was fine. And so it just shows how distressing these worries can be for people with body dysmorphic disorder. That is great to know. That's very helpful. A question, because you touched on it and you talked about how important it is to screen. I know that you have developed the body dysmorphic disorder questionnaire or the BDDQ, and you've also worked with other uh, and created some other tools, including the BDD Y box for OCD leanings, um, as well as the olfactory reference syndrome testing and some other measurement scales as well. You talk about screening and we're obviously large proponents of screening, screen everyone, screen early, screen often. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the BDDQ, how it works, what it screens for and how long it takes, how it's incorporated into a practice? That would be wonderful. Sure. Um, well, the body dysmorphic disorder questionnaire, the BDDQ is a brief self-report questionnaire that screens for the presence of BDD. Um, and it's very good at identifying BDD when it's present. It can be used in a variety of settings. It can be used in mental health settings. It can be used in cosmetic surgery settings, dermatology settings. Um, and uh, if a patient answers no to the first few questions, then it takes just you know less than a minute. Um, if they answer yes, then it takes a little bit longer, but it's, it's brief. And um, which is one of, I think it's assets. And ideally, I think if a person screens positive for BDD on the BDDQ, ideally the diagnosis should be confirmed uh, by a clinician, for example, to determine that the appearance flaws that the patient perceives are actually non-existent or only slight, as opposed to clearly obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, again, it, it's, quick and, and easy to use and effective at identifying uh, BDD. And as I mentioned, it's important to screen, you know, because cosmetic treatments tend not to almost never work. We have good psychiatric treatments that, that do work well for most patients. Um, so uh, it's important to use in, in a whole variety of settings. The BDD Y box uh, is uh, sort of um, modeled after, derived from the Y box for OCD, which is the most widely used severity measure um, of OCD. The BDD Y box, again, sort of modified slightly for BDD, is the most widely used severity measure of, of BDD. And it's, uh, again, fairly quick to administer. It's uh, 12 questions. And um, assesses severity of BDD. It's been used in most of the treatment studies of BDD that have been done and, and uh, very, you know, it's a great, it's a, it's a great scale for assessing uh, BDD severity. Um, and then you asked about um, olfactory reference syndrome, also called olfactory reference disorder. I'm so glad you asked this question. This disorder is even less recognized than BDD is. It's, it's um, not as well studied at this point. Uh, but these are people who think they em emit a foul or offensive body odor. They think they smell really bad, that they have terrible bad breath, for example, or that they smell very sweaty, but they don't. Again, like BDD, it's a misperception, um, but it, it, they, they can do all, you know, various repetitive behaviors, checking to see if they really, you know, smell bad, which they think they do no matter what. Um, and maybe excessive showering, um, trying to hide the odor, perhaps with lots of perfume or deodorant. But again, they don't they don't smell bad, um, and they can re they really suffer a lot as well. Like the patients with BDD, high rates of suicidal thinking, suicidal behavior, um, and um, you know difficulty in day to day functioning. So uh, this is another. Uh, disorder that it's very important to screen for. Um, these patients also, you know, many of them see mental health clinicians, but many of them go to see dermatologists because they think they, they have a sweating problem or they go to see ear, nose and throat doctors, otolaryngologists, because they think, you know, maybe their tonsils are making their breath smell bad. But again, they, they, they do not emit an odor. They just think they do. And it's, it's uh, something that clinicians need to look for. And, um, and so the uh, Y-box modified for olfactory reference syndrome 
uh, screens, you know, actually assesses the severity of this disorder and um, there are ways to, you know, diagnose, screen and diagnose for this disorder as well.